kicking off my new franchise. The galaxy is our telephone wire. We'll do a thousand seasons, 14 episodes each, nine, nine seconds a pop, you know what I mean? Forever. Rick and Two Crows forever. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Rick and Morty Season 5 Episode 9 video. Even though it was a two-part finale, I'll do a separate Episode 10 video that'll post in a couple hours later tonight. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. Obviously, there's a bunch of Rick and Morty Season 6 stuff that they'll be talking about really soon, too. I'll do videos for that as well. Careful for spoilers if you have not seen Episode 9. I'll also reference a couple things from Episode 10, but this will mostly just be about Episode 9. And even though it wasn't part of the actual episode, we have to talk about Christopher Lloyd playing a live action version of Rick from this Rick and Morty promo that they did with one of the actors from the It movie. This is Jaden Martell. He played Bill during the new It movie. Morty, <coughs> we're home. Oh, jeez. But the whole thing with Christopher Lloyd being live action Rick is that it's sort of bringing the Easter eggs full circle because Doc and Marty, Justin Roiland's original precursor for the Rick and Morty series, was based on Back to the Future, with Rick being specifically based on Doc Brown. So it's crazy that they got real life Christopher Lloyd to do this. The network also said that they originally tried to get Daniel Radcliffe to play the Morty during this, but he turned them down just because he was a little too old for the part. Can you imagine Harry Potter playing a version of Morty during this? That would be even crazier, but they're just meant to be promos, they're not for the actual episodes. I'll number these as we go along just to stay organized, but starting with the title of the episode, Forgetting Sarek Marshall, which is a reference to the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall, where the protagonist tries to get over this bad breakup and gets into a new relationship. Rick and Morty have a breakup during the episode. They both try to start new sidekick relationships. They also heavily reference the Dark Crystal movie with the Skeksis and the actual Dark Crystal itself with the crows. Rick and Two Crows Forever. You could also call this episode the tragedy of Garbage Goober. But the episode starts with Morty going around cleaning up after Rick on previous adventures, showing the true consequences of what Rick's actions are and how he leaves this wake of total destruction. It makes it seem like he doesn't actually care about any of the people he encounters during his adventures. This is obviously setting up a lot of the big reveals that evil Morty drops, the big bombshells during episode 10, the finale. They start on the cookie theme planet, which is meant to be a parody of the Candy Kingdom from Adventure Time. Justin Roiland did a lot of work on Adventure Time. The Rick and Morty people are also friends in real life with the Adventure Time people. So this is like the darkest timeline version of the Adventure Time Candy Kingdom, where a bunch of candy terrorists have overrun the government and are going to kill the cookie president executing him on live television, which is also a candy themed television camera. Morty whips out the list of planets that he's going to, and it does seem like he does stuff like this on the regular. Next up is Water City, there's Spider Bot, Lava Crystal, Tip Jar, there's a Nuclear Worm, Return Conk, Bean Hordes, and Moon Gremlin. All these are references to the different types of disasters on the different planets that he has to undo. The second planet he goes to is the Water City with the fish people whose city is flooding because Rick crashed his ship through the dam that was holding back their ocean. Then he saves another planet from a lava creature, and you probably recognize this, this is a big Disney Moana parody. In Moana, the lava creature becomes this big monstrous villain after its heart is stolen. So they're saying that Rick stole the lava creature's special gem and then it started rampaging. When Morty goes back, he pulls the old liquor bottle trick with Rick's portal gun in Mountain Dew. A bunch of you have probably done something like this at some point when you were teenagers. Like a lot of people's parents marked their liquor bottles and if you drank from them, you'd have to refill the bottles with fluid that looked the same color to make it seem like nobody had been drinking anything. That's also meant to foreshadow Evil Morty hacking the Citadel of Rick's portal guns with altered portal fluid in the finale. Even though the portal gun says that weird fluid is a good thing, Rick claims that if he'd used it this way with the Mountain Dew in it, he might have transported his lips right off of his body. This is all obviously setting up the whole B storyline with Morty and Nick, the crazy man who tried to steal Rick's portal gun from the bar. Nick claims that before his portal was connected to Morty's portal, he was just using it as a stash hole to throw away his trash. Rick then reveals Garbage Gooper, who is actually a pretty funny character, a creature that he just uses like a living Roomba to hoover up trash. Summer winds up using it too during the post credit scene, so I guess the whole family uses it around the house all the time for just all kinds of random stuff, but they turn it into this way bigger tragic arc during the episode. Like Garbage Gooper is a Harvard educated physician, but he's been reduced to Rick's living garbage can and his wife even makes him a regular spaghetti dinner. Then Rick fires Morty and to rub salt in the wound, pulls out that Wheel of Fortune game to pick his new sidekick. 
Later, the Ravens literally call this joke out for being lame, like, we get it, it's a simple joke, you're trying to say that Morty's so dumb that two Ravens could replace him, therefore the Ravens are also kind of dumb, but we just taught you empathy like 10 minutes ago. Because it's a two-part finale, the whole idea of the Ravens being more intelligent than Rick, kind of, I mean they kind of weren't because he did wind up outsmarting them by the end of the episode, is also meant to be in service of the idea that the central finite curve is only an area of the multiverse where Ricks are supreme, so there are other universes out there in the larger multiverse where Rick is not the smartest person. And it turns out that Ravens are a way more cosmic race in the multiverse than you ever thought. But all the other picks for sidekicks on his wheel, all the other options, start with Jerry, and I love that it says in parentheses, spin again, because there's no way that he's gonna let Jerry be a sidekick. Kyle 2.0 is a reference to Kyle, who was mentioned by Mr. Nimbus during Season 5 Episode 1, the person who was supposedly Rick's sidekick before this version of Morty. They imply that Kyle had died at some point, but I'd hope that Nick, the crazy person in this episode, would wind up being a version of Kyle, but no luck there. There's a bag of meat, like a literal non-living simple bag of meat, half of a Paul Giamatti, which I think is another callback to season 4 with the train conductor who was played by Paul Giamatti, the old man with the crazy abs. One of the options is just a sentient piece of crap. There's Gene with donkey brains. Gene is their neighbor. He's shown up or been referenced several times this season already. There are the two crows, which Rick lands on. And then there's the garbage goober is an option, which they use for another joke later when it tries to manipulate the wheel to make itself Rick's new sidekick. Like, not now, garbage goober. They let this whole B storyline with Morty and the mental patient Nick play out for a long time before revealing the twist, even though he's telling the truth mostly about how Morty needs to break free of the abusive relationship with Rick, leave it all behind. He even tells him not to come find him. But eventually it's revealed that he's gaslighting Morty this whole time, just kind of manipulating him so that he can get his hands on Rick's technology and be just like Rick, or he thinks that it will make him just like Rick if he has Rick's technology. They play up this big joke about Rick training the crows to set up the gag with the hyper-intelligent race of crows based on the Dark Crystal, Skeksis, and set up the bird Quaaludes joke that they pay off at the end of the episode with the psychics becoming super evolved crow people in helping them because it seems like they're doing this just for the drugs and as a rebound from their last relationship, as we find out in episode 10. Like Rick was using them as a rebound for Morty, but they were using him as a rebound for Crow Scare. They also set up the bird on a wire joke, which is part of that big end twist too. In the context of the episode, the phrase bird on a wire is also a metaphor for Rick and Morty's whole relationship. Originally that phrase was a reference to the practice of putting lime on wire fences or creating wire traps to trap songbirds. Then the birds would sing trying to escape, but doing so in vain, like they'd be unable to escape. So in the episode, Morty attempts to break free from Rick, and Rick attempts to break free from Morty, but neither one of them are successful. We find out that Rick turned Morty's bicycle into a mini spaceship so that he could have solo adventures, but the adventures were just meant to be him doing Rick's common errands. Notice Morty's spaceship also shares the same design language as Rick's ship. It's also built out of garbage and common household items. Even though they have the joke about the carbon chamber catapult that Rick uses to throw people, Morty says that Rick uses it all the time, that's how they lost their cable guy, it's meant to be a different weapon than the bank vacuum tubes that he uses later to send the crows to the crow planet. The whole thing with the mental hospital here is just meant to be a reference to the mental hospital from Terminator 2 with Sarah Connor when he references the guards beating them up on certain days, but that's not as bad as the other days because on the other days they lick our faces while we're tied down. So if it wasn't clear, this whole time, Nick is just playing Morty to get him to release him, allow him to get his hands on Rick's portal gun. The Jackie Chan reference with them kicking the crap out of the guards using their portal connection is just referencing pretty much all of Jackie Chan's crazy fight scenes in his movies. Really, any movie he's ever done would qualify. Although Nick kind of turns it into more of a Rush Hour movie Easter egg because he mentions Chris Tucker from the Rush Hour movies. Rick winds up using the two crows to pull an Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark adventure with the idol, but then playing it as a joke about the real treasure being empathy, which they pay off at the end of the episode where Rick says, man, those are some empathetic crows. Rick then learns about the super advanced crows when he tries to fire his crows to leave them on the planet of highly advanced bird cultures. The other joke here too is that when he says working under him for a day will make them like apex geniuses compared to the other birds on the planet, it winds up being true. His two crow sidekicks eventually outsmart the hyper-intelligent Skeksis birds. This is also at least the second time another race has had technology advanced enough to trap Rick like this, the last time being the time dilation race that Morty started the war with over the wine. 
Everyone has probably seen the Dark Crystal, so you know all about the Skeksis references with the castle from the series, but if you didn't know the lore of the Dark Crystal story in their universe, it's actually a combination of science fiction and fantasy, kind of like Star Wars, because the Skeksis were created when a highly advanced spacefaring race sought to evolve themselves even more, but wound up using their giant crystal to split themselves into different aspects, the Skeksis and the Mystics. So their whole castle and everything in it is super advanced technology that just looks like a typical fantasy genre castle. That whole psychobabble speech about not needing to train the crows and getting on the same wavelength is just meant to be a metaphor for him dealing with his relationship problems with Morty, like getting in touch with his emotions in a way that Rick always refuses to do. And it kind of turns into a Star Wars use the force kind of thing, with him just kind of giving into the power of the crows in a cosmic way, and it allows them to work together as a much more effective team which itself is sort of a metaphor for relationships in general. Rick kind of calls this out during episode 10 of the finale too, where he says, oh, this is all clearly metaphor for relationships. When Nick and Morty break back into the garage, Morty reveals that Rick had trapped him in a version of the Matrix before. The gun that Nick winds up stealing also kind of seems like a video game gun. If you think you know which one it's referencing, write it below in the comments, because usually all the guns on Rick and Morty are references to video game guns. I also think this is the first time I've seen someone on the show pick up Rick's Morningstar that's been sitting on the shelf here since the very beginning of the show. They start wrecking the garage with Jerry using the butt gun to cover the place in farting butts. Obviously Jerry's really excited here because he still kind of hates Rick, but turns himself into a puddle that they kind of ignore for the rest of the episode. They steal an early prototype of Rick's portal gun. This also helps foreshadow the montage of Rick's backstory during the finale when you see him creating his portal guns and trying to track down the version of Rick who killed his wife and the original Beth. Because remember, they revealed earlier this season that he was a Rick who moved in with some other Rick's abandoned Beth. The whole design of the Skeksis ship when they show up seems very familiar, but I can't remember which character this is a reference to. So if you think you know the reference, please write it below in the comments. I love the way how Rick refers to their house as the one with the poop brown roof. Very specific. The only weird thing during this episode, normally there's a lot of weird stuff in Rick and Morty episodes, but the weirdest thing here was when they use the classic comedy slide whistle reaction noise when they open the garage door. Like that feels like some crazy deep cut from a British comedy TV show from back in the 80s. The crows call him out for being an asshole for using the wheel. They turn all crows nearby against humans. Then while that's going off the rails, Morty and Nick take the family's car, which Rick had also upgraded into a spaceship previously, to capture a person who supplies Rick with crystals that he uses to create his portal gun fluid. And if it wasn't clear here, the aliens explain to them that they themselves did not create the actual portal fluid themselves. They just harvested the crystals used to make the fluid. And because they want to wrap the Nick storyline up during this episode and not spill into the next episode, he goes off the rails super quick. He reveals the truth about who he really is. He was just a crazy person who sat near Rick at a local bar and just heard his adventure stories while he was getting drunk and tried to steal his portal gun one night, just became obsessed with him. Probably the most WTF thing from this whole third act climax with Morty here is him chopping his hand off using the train to kill Nick by sucking him into a sort of paradoxical portal loop that collapses on itself. When Rick is running around the Skeksis ship making all the Dark Crystal references, when the alarm goes off and he says, is anything here not on theme, what he means is during the Dark Crystal movie, the Skeksis castle had an alarm system that went off and sounded kind of like this. Their whole giant sacred egg is obviously a version of the actual Dark Crystal. They pay off that whole bird quaaludes joke when his crows rescue him in exchange for drugs, like deal and deal, you get all the quaaludes you want. Rick steals their technology and a devolution gun, which is a huge deep cut. Like he says, I'm keeping this, but it's a reference to the awful, awful live action Super Mario Brothers movie with Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo, and Dennis Hopper as King Koopa. During that movie, they had the Super Nintendo Super Scope guns that they called the devolution guns that would de-evolve creatures. They also pay off the bird on a wire attack joke, destroying the crystal and the rest of the birds. They use the crow storyline to pay off Morty and Rick's relationship, like he causes him to think more about the nature of their relationship. I love the way that crows seem like they're more emotionally in touch with themselves than Rick, which seems very on brand for Rick. When he goes back to help Morty, he whips out a device for hand regeneration, and it's called a nice and handy, which is a reference to a hand job, which is hilarious. Of course, Rick would give his toys sexual pun names. But the options for different hands that he could give him are a pirate hook, a lizard hand with claws, a bird hand, a horse hoof, and one that seems kind of like a duck hand or like another animated character from another series. Then Rick reveals that he's gone full Team Crow to see what more they can teach him, these cosmic beings, 
with a whole joke of the spinoff show, Rick and Two Crows, and does a full version of the Rick and Morty rant from the pilot episode, and they did it during season three as well, but even more over the top than he's done before, mostly to set up the opening scene for episode 10 for the finale. I also think they tried to make it seem so ridiculous and over the top that you understand clearly that this is just a joke and they're not actually creating this specific spinoff show. Rick then shows Morty that he trusts him now, gives him his portal gun, paying off their argument from the beginning of the episode, and just to go through all the things that he rants about. So he says a thousand seasons this time. When he says 14 episodes per season, it's a response to the complaint early on that originally Rick and Morty had planned to do 14 episodes per season. But Dan and Justin said that they ran into production issues, so they had to wind up doing 10 episodes per season. And then he just turns it into a big TikTok joke. Nine seconds a pop because that's the future of viewing. Shows on your shoes. Sneaky. But then the post credit scene is them paying off the big garbage goober joke with him being this Harvard educated doctor, but being reduced to Rick's trash bin and not being able to break free of that relationship. If you spotted any other Easter eggs during episode nine that I didn't talk about during the video, just write them below in the comments. My full Rick and Morty season five episode 10 finale video will post next in a couple hours. So make sure you have alerts enabled for my channel so you don't miss that because it is a big evil Morty episode. My Marvel What If episode five video will be posting this Wednesday, just like normal. Also links for all those other videos down in the description below. Everyone click here for my Rick and Morty season five episode 10 finale video. I'll update the link when I post that video later today and click here for my Marvel Shang-Chi post credit scene video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.